Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and I am very excited to be um, doing one of our Tuesday afternoon launch day events um, with authors in the UK. It's always um, special to be able to talk to people we might not be talking to in person, even um, pre-COVID, and um, especially now. So we're going to be um, speaking with Louise Candlish and Lisa Jewell this afternoon. Um, Louise is book came out today. It is The Other Passenger. And anyone who orders a copy of it um, will get, sorry, the light is so tricky on these. Uh, we'll get a signed book plate. There you go. Just trust me on it. It's a signed book plate. Um, we're also uh, doing this event today in conjunction with Blue Heron Books in Canada. So if you are a Canadian viewer, I'm putting a link in the comments for how you can purchase a copy of the book from Blue Heron. Um, again, if you're a, a US consumer, one of our regular customers, you're gonna use the normal Murder by the Book link that has more information about um, both Louise and Lisa and their books. Um, but we do want to make sure that the um, Canadian viewers that we're working in, in um, conjunction with Blue Heron today, they can um, order from Blue Heron. So, um, okay, let me go ahead and get started with bringing on um, Louise here. Hi, Louise, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. It's nice to meet you, albeit virtually. Hopefully we'll get to see you in Houston sometime. Oh, I really hope so. I've never been to Houston, so a first time calls. Perfect. Well, well, you're welcome anytime. Um, so let me do your official uh, bio really quickly, and then we'll bring on Lisa. Louise Candlish is the number, excuse me, is the Sunday Times bestselling author of 14 novels. Our House, a number one bestseller, won the Crime and Thriller Book of the Year at the 2019 British Book Awards, was long listed for the 2019 Theakston Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year, and was shortlisted for the Goldsboro Books Glass Bell Award. It's now in development for a major TV series with Red Planet Pictures, producers of Death in Paradise. Louise lives in London with her husband and daughter, and as I said, um, this book, the other passenger is out today in paperback in uh, the U.S. And it also has already uh, been award nominated and regaled with uh, praise in the U.K. It's been out for a while. So make sure um, make sure you take a look at it. And um, and we would love if you would order it from us. Thanks so much for being here. You're very welcome. This is a wonderful treat. Thank you. It's very, very hot here in London. So I'm kind of <laughs> melting slightly. So sorry about my shiny face, everyone. <laughs> you look great. There's no, no issues. Okay. We also are joined by um, longtime store favorite, Lisa Jewell. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hi. I'm, 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 I'm dressed for the weather, so but actually, I think I feel quite shiny also. <laughs> Um, okay, Lisa Jewell is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 19 novels, including The Family Upstairs, and Then She Was Gone, as well as Invisible Girl and Watching You. Her novels have sold over 5 million copies internationally, and her work has also been translated into 29 languages. Um, I will say that we have her most recent book in paperback is Invisible Girl. Again, light is a hard thing to figure out. There we go. Um, but fingers crossed. We have a date on hold for an in-store visit, a live in-person event for The Night She Disappeared, which is your book coming out September 7th in the U.S., and we have you on the books for September 8th. So yes. let's just keep thinking that's going to happen. <laughs> Honestly, it feels like a far-fetched concept from current situation, but you never know. I'm, I'm keeping <laughs> it I, I mean, fingers and toes, but yes, we'll see. Toes, hopefully, yeah. hopefully that works. For those of you interested in pre-ordering a copy of that book, I also just dropped a link in the comments that has information about the event. If you, uh, we're, we're going to assume this event is happening. We're going to just will it into existence. So if you're interested in pre-ordering um, or getting a personalized copy, you can do that. Just put your personalization request in the comments. Um, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Put those in the live chat on YouTube or in the um, comments on Facebook, and we'll get to them in a little bit. But for now, we're going to start talking about these books. So Louise, The Other Passenger, brand new out today. Tell me about it in your words, please. 
Well, it's a very sort of twisty thriller with some fairly dark, dislikable characters. I'm calling it Commuter Noir because it's set on the river boats in London on the Thames. And these are real boats, they're catamarans that bring the commuters in from the east and the west into the centre of London, the financial district and the West End. And um, the, the narrator, Jamie, um, takes his commute in this way. And he usually sits next to his um, little friend, Kit, who's 20 years younger than him. Jamie's almost 50, Kit's about 30. And, um, you know, they've got this kind of posse on the boat, um, that kind of commuter camaraderie. But when we enter the story at the beginning, um, Jamie finds that Kit hasn't turned up for their usual service. And when Jamie gets off at his stop, he's met by the police and they want to talk to him about the fact that Kit has been reported missing. And Jamie was the last person seen with Kit. Not only that, but they were arguing furiously and all of this was witnessed by a, another passenger. And, um, and so that starts us off in Jamie's terrible predicament before you start to go back a little bit and discover um, both of their partners and this very um, incestuous little double dating scene the four of them had going. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a double crossing tale, I would say. There's lots of deception and um, lots of skullduggery. Yes. Um, <laughs> was there a real life inspiration to the story or something that made you think I should set, set a book on a fairy? Well, yes, actually. I mean, I, I'd love to, to hear um, if Lisa has anything similar in the way her books are conceived, because I generally have three or four obsessions burning in the back of my mind, usually when I'm finishing the book before or working on another project or um, publicizing a book. And um, in this case, one of the things I really wanted to do was a commuter story, because I've always been really fascinated by those sort of, um, you know, superficial friendships that can build up when you get the same train every day and sit in the same seat. And, you know, there is that kind of posse mentality. Um, but because we've had the girl on the train and, you know, quite a lot of train set books, I just, I didn't want to copy that and, and sort of chase that trend. So, so for a while I couldn't think how I could set it, how I could do my commuter mystery, but make it original. And then one day um, I was going to the O2, which is a big arena in Southeast London here. And the tube was down and I had to get, you know, get there somehow. And I remembered these ferries that go down the river. And as soon as I got on and sat in my seat, I realized that it was the most special setting and it all started to piece together in my mind. It was only about a 30 minute journey. And by the time I got off, I knew what my next project was. So it was magical and wonderful. Doesn't happen that easily usually. How about you, Lisa? Um, for Invisible Girl, what was what was the, the starting point for that? Well, actually, yeah, it was um, not quite as specific as, as finding, uh, finding a, 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 a boat <laughs> set the whole story on. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it actually was quite specific, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I was. Um, it was it was snowing here in London, which is unthinkable here today because it's tropically hot. Um, and I was walking up the road, and there were all the children had just come out of school and were throwing snowballs at each other. And through this snowball fight, this large, lugubrious man appeared who looked like he had all the weight of the world on his shoulders. And something about him just captured my imagination. He looked like his life had been very disappointing. Um, and he looked like, th this is what it was, he looked like the kind of guy where if he worked in your office, if he was a colleague in your office and you were in the kitchen and he came into the kitchen, you would want to leave the kitchen because he's just so, slightly creepy. <laughs> One of those guys who just makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable to be around. Yeah. And I just thought, I just had that feeling of like, I wonder what the world looks like from his eyes. I wonder what it feels like to wake up every morning and be this guy. Who's, who's a life appeared from. I saw this guy for all of 10 seconds and I built this entire <laughs> entire life story for him. Um, and so in fact, the working title for Invisible Girl was Creep because that was what I, that was what I set out to write about. I wanted to write about a creepy guy and I wanted to write about him from somebody else's perspective. Um, so I put him on a street in North London and um, 
put a family in the house opposite and watch them react to this guy. And the teenage daughter from the family thinks he followed her home from the tube station. Um, and the mother thinks that he's responsible for some sex attacks that have been going on in the local area. And then when the main character in the book, Invisible, the Invisible Girl herself, goes missing, um, and he's the last person to see her alive, the spotlight of suspicion falls on him. So yes, it was really all about this 10 second glimpse of a man on the street looking a bit grumpy. Um, yeah. So, Have you so seen that, him that since? Awesome. Did you ever see him a second time? I wouldn't recognise him if I saw him again. I really, I could have walked past him a hundred times in the street since and not noticed. It was just something about the look in his eye that day. He was probably just annoyed by all the children running around um, <laughs> and just sort of wanted to get away from them. But yeah, he, he just sort of flicked a switch in my head. And I thought, I want to write about you. I want to be you, actually, because we're very weird, us writers. That's all. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's, so, it's so weird. We and kind of just want to about the people, don't we? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, you know, you so often meet people and they don't seem to be interested in anyone but themselves. But I yeah. think that writers are sort yeah. of much more interested in other people than themselves. I mean, do you ever have this, <laughs> what, this hollow, sad feeling, Louise? And I'm sure this isn't just writers who feel like this, but this sort of terribly sad feeling that you're never going to know what it feels like to be somebody else that you walk past people all the time and they've got these rich interior worlds and these lives full of detail and 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 drama and everything and you'll never ever get to be them no no it's like being it's a bit like being trapped isn't it, it yeah it you're, like you're trapped, trapped in yourself, yourself. yeah yeah and I remember yeah. the, I remember the moment when I realized um that I had a sort of consciousness and these, you know, this sort of, you know, internal monologue. I was probably about 12 or something. And before that, I hadn't really sort of considered what it was. And um, and, and I still remember the moment when I thought, oh, my God, everyone else must have one of these yeah. in, inside their head. And, yeah. um, and and there's no way of swapping. Yes. A a lot of all, unless you're telepathic, obviously. Or unless you write novels. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's the nearest we get, isn't it? Yeah. And that's yeah. why it's such a privilege. It is, it really is. paid to spend your time imagining other people's thoughts, although my own often, you know, sort of start to merge with my characters. Yes, <laughs> yes that does happen. But that's one of the richest experiences when you're when you're writing is when you know it's got nothing to do with you, when you're inside a character's head and you know you're not inside their head and it's all coming from them. That's sort of... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happen. it's really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Ruth Ware, Louise, Ruth Ware has called you the queen of the sucker punch twist. And I don't think that there's a single blurb or review of any of Lisa's books that don't talk about how twisty they are. Um, how do you how do you consistently manage that? And um, when you're is it plotting? Is it not plotting? Is it um, I mean, how do you just keep coming up with these twists? And let's start with you, Louise, but I'm sure that Lisa can check in here. <laughs> I'm sure I won't have a definitive answer. And also, I, I happen to know that we we plan our books quite differently. Yes. I'm, I'm a plotter. I mean, it's not kind of, you know, control freakery, but I do have a loose plot before I start writing. And I certainly will know what the big revelations are. And I don't tend to think of them as twists. I tend to think of them as revelations or just dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. um, I strive to not have a twist that is there for the sake of it, just because there's supposed to be a twist. I like it to be very integral to the story and a genuine surprise and something that readers could have um, detected and pieced together through a few little clues that I might have scattered. So there, so I know those from the start. Um, but having said that, sometimes you might be halfway through writing and have a, an amazing idea for a twist or, you know, this sort of extra bit of narrative trickery, say, um, and, um, and then I'll have to sit back and decide whether or not I'm going to go with it because I have found that it can be more trouble than it's worth if you retrofit a cool idea, um, it, the ripple effect over what you already thought you'd finished. Um, is quite disruptive. So it's a kind, it's a fluid process. But I, when I set out, I feel like I know, I know what's going to happen. I know, you know, that I know the crime and I know the mechanics of the crime. I know the succession of revelations, and then I, I know, you know, who did it and why they did it and what happens to them. I don't always know how I'm going to um, do that or um, end the book, but but I know quite a lot. So, so yeah, I, I guess it's in the, the twists come in the planning for me. 
and yeah, Lisa, yeah. Yeah, 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 entirely different, entirely different. So, <laughs> so Louise is, is leagues ahead of the reader as she's writing. Right? <laughs> We're generally speaking about a chapter ahead of the reader in terms of doing, knowing what's going on and what's going to happen next and who did it and, and what the next revelation is going to be. Um, so, yes, a, 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 a reader at an event once gave me a very, very handy um, descriptor for what the way, for the way I write, because I've always kind of talked about the way I write as if it's wrong, because I don't <laughs> plot, and I wing it. Um, and she said, she said, no, that's not right. What you do is you plot on the page. I said, yes, thank you. That sounds so much better than winging it and pantsing it. And <laughs> yeah, I don't like that pantsing. Up, I like, go a along. very crude um, description. And, and it was it was a it was a game changer for me. Her saying that because for the first time I thought of it as a, as a positive thing. Yeah. But some readers Ooh, some definitely. readers plot at plot on on a whiteboard. Some readers plot su substantially inside their own heads, so they've got the whole thing inside their own heads. Um, and some writers plot on the page, and that's what I do. And I'm constantly surprising myself with things that just end up, you know, I'm, I'm tapping my keyboard and words appear on the screen and words that I wrote thought, think, unthinkingly, not thoughtlessly, unthinkingly two months earlier come to play a huge part in something that happens further down the line in the story. So it's, it's for me, it's very instinctive and it's very, and, and this is why I've, I've only just in the last few books that started to enjoy writing because I never really did enjoy writing. And now I really do enjoy it because of confidence. And that's a wonderful thing that you get when you get to this, this point in our careers, Louise, wouldn't yeah. you agree that you're, yeah. you're you're confident. And so I know that if I've written something, there's a reason why I've written it. And I will find a way to make it work. And it might seem random and I might not have a clue how it's going to fit into the story later on. But I know that it will because I know that I'm not very good at many things in this world. But that's the thing that I'm good at. Is making, <laughs> is making it all work. I can do that. Um, so, yes. So that that's how I plot just very much sort of in the moment and, and worry about yeah, the finished product. Honestly, I feel like you you deserve embroidery prizes. I mean, they're beautifully woven and it's it feels as if you're completely in control of, yeah. of the placement of every every passage. But so I the am. idea that, that it was, you know, slightly more chaotic in its you know, and I, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that is why it feels so ornate is because I have to write myself so carefully towards each thing because it's not already in my head. So it's not like I'm writing the beginning of a chapter and I already know what's going to be happening at the end of the chapter. So I just need to fill in those pages. I need to everything. It, it has to be quite sort of detailed because I'm working it out as I go. So, it, it, yeah, I think that's what it, it's, it's an op, it's an illusion It's an absolute illusion that I, it means that I had a plan it just means I have to write very slowly and delicately so that it's I don't genius. I think it's myself genius. into a corner or a hole yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. Don't, you don't find yourself having written passages or you write you know you write a first draft and then you you don't pick it apart and put things in certain places like move chunks of the book around like when you've written it you've written it is that correct oh no 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 <laughs> No, I move things around constantly. It's, How about you, um, so, so my plan is that when I when I say I plot, it's really scaffolding, um, mm -hmm. and then um, you know afterwards I'm I'm placing the rooms and you know the walls and you know all of yeah. the all of the furnishings. Um, so it really is just keeping it keeping its shape. This initial plot, but yeah, I move things around constantly. I just did it today. You know, sort of I I move scenes around, I move chapter order, I'm, I cut masses, I often have five or six drafts, I might eliminate a whole subplot at someone else's suggestion, a uh, talented editor say, um, or, re or create something quite new late on. So it, it, it's loose. I think that I've, again, as Lisa says, confidence is the word. You just now, we know we can do it. We trust ourselves to get there in the end. And so I'm not remotely frightened if it feels like it's out of control and I'm not wrangling it properly that day or even that month. I know that it will come to me yeah. and we'll figure it out. And, you know, definitely with the collaboration of great 
talented professionals as well. I mean, if you read my first draft of any of my books, I think you'd be quite shocked. They really improve once they've been, um, you know, through the through the process. Yeah, no, I, I'm much more. The, my my earlier books were very much more like that. They were much more like rooms inside a sort of yeah, the, the scaffolding and then the moving everything around inside that, and everything being fluid and changing a lot and cutting out subplots and cutting out characters and switching things around. And I don't do that anymore. I tend to just write in a straight line. Um, occasionally there'll be there'll be something. So for example. Um, I'm currently writing the sequel to The Family Upstairs um, and I've been telling one strand of the story from the point of view of Lucy, who is a character, obviously one of the original characters from um, The Family Upstairs. And that was my goal, was to keep telling her side of the sequel story um, from her perspective. And I've just got to a point, um, how many words am I in? 40,000 words where I've just realised that actually a lot of her story would be more interesting told from the perspective of her 13 year old son Marco because she knows too much so every time yeah, I go to yeah. her she knows too much whereas Marco doesn't really know anything so I am going to do a little bit of jiggery pokery and rewrite a couple of Lucy's chapters from Marco's perspective and then gradually move away from Lucy and into Marco in a way that the reader will think I had planned to do all along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but which I've only just decided would, would, would make the story stronger and be more fun for me to write as well. Because it's always fun to write from the point of view of a character who doesn't really know what's going on and needs to uncover the truth. So yeah, but yeah, mainly, mainly speaking, my book looks, looks the same if, if somebody read it halfway through and then read the finished thing, they probably wouldn't notice all the tweaks and polishes and what have you, because there's not that much structural stuff that happens in between. That's great, because that's quite, it is quite scary when you're doing really big stuff in an yeah. edit and, you know, time's starting to press yeah, on. That's the thing. <laughs> that is, that time is the thing as well. That is very much a sort of, oh God, I could, but then I'm, yes, but then I'm going to have to be writing 2,000 words a day for, for weeks instead of 1,000 words a day and what have you. So yes, yeah, stick with this version. <laughs> Yeah, and, and people say all the time, don't they? You know, how do you how do you finish a whole book? And you know, I'm like, well, a legally binding contract. Yes, a legally it. binding I mean, contract. <laughs> line in it. I wouldn't yeah. be able to sleep at night if I knowing <laughs> that I wasn't delivering the book when I said yeah. I was. Exactly, exactly. And particularly when you get to the point that Louise and I have reached where, you know, we sell well for our publishers, um, which means that the more books you sell, the more the team is sort of relying on having your book in their hands at a certain point so that they can start the whole publicity and marketing and sales machine. Yeah. Um, so you're not just holding up your editor, you're holding <laughs> up this whole little sort of universe of people. Um, so you've got that. That's quite a big weight on your shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> It gets you writing, it gets you writing. It does, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I've, neither of us have that kind of, I think, um, you know, I, I certainly don't ever allow myself the indulgence of waiting for inspiration. No, no, you know, no. I, it, I'm straight onto it. And if I, if I really am not in the mood to write, then I would do something else extremely useful. Yes. You know, I'll edit or I'll, you know, sort of go back to my timeline, which is usually quite complicated, and I'll nail that down. So I'll just do something, you know, always. It, it's about efficiency. Yes. Um, when you're writing a book a year, you just, you just can't sit waiting for the muse. No. And you also have to write through the rubbish as well. You can yeah. have days where you've written a thousand rubbish words, but you know that that's, you've still made progress with those thousand rubbish words. You have moved things along. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's the writing exactly. of no words. Writing of no words is much worse than writing of bad words. It really is. Yeah, no, definitely. I remember watching a great interview with um, Ian Rankin where he's shown on the train coming down from Edinburgh down to London. And um, and he says to the camera, I'm going to read my manuscript and I'm going to see if it's as bad as I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so true. You know, you know, yeah. it takes such a lot of work and such a lot of redrafting and, um, you know, just, just a lot of hard graft yes. to get a novel into a really entertaining, enjoyable, where, you know, sort of um, structure and um, shape. So, um yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big job that we condense into sort of nine months or a year. Exactly, yes, exactly. So you already answered like 
<laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's great. I just sit back and listen. It's, it's fun <laughs> for me. Um, do you have any special routine to your writing? You sit down, you're ready to write. Do you drink a certain drink? Do you listen to music? <laughs> Don't listen to music. Are you too professional at this point? Like you just sit down and do it. <laughs> you, I think people are really shocked when they learn of my writing scenario because I don't have an office or a desk. I sit on the sofa <laughs> in, my, in my living room, usually with my dog by my side and a laptop. And um, yeah, I mean, I, it, somehow I've managed to avoid back problems so far. Say, because it's clearly not a healthy, I, you know, not the best thing to do therapeutically. <laughs> but I just find that that's where, that's where I'm most productive. And um, I'll always have a very strong coffee by my side because I'm a coffee addict. And in terms of music, um, music's really important in inspiring me, actually. And um, usually my characters will be listening to certain music or they'll have a favorite band. So in The Other Passenger, my favorite scene is when the femme fatale um, girl, Melia, is dancing um, by the river with her friend at her wedding to um, Lana Del Rey. And it, if, if, if you were to go and, you know, listen to that song and hear those lyrics, you know, tell, it gives you a lot of clues about, you know, who she is and what's going to happen. Um, and, uh, and then Jamie's really into the kinks. And, you know, so he's, he's quite retro. And, um, you know, he's one of those quite smug, middle-aged men who knows quite a lot about music and he loves to, to um, impart that knowledge to Kit. And um, yeah, so so it's for me, it's quite important for me to know what music my characters are into. Um, and, you know, it usually coincides with stuff that I'm enjoying listening to as well. Um, but it, when I'm actually writing, I can't listen to music with lyrics because I my mind will, will um, follow the, the words I'm hearing. So I can only listen to, you know, like a movie soundtrack or, um, you know, any anything without lyrics and usually I just you know I just write in silence actually how about you Lisa uh yeah so I don't have an office um or um yeah, or a study either um and before the pandemic I had got into a really nice really nice productive routine um of, of splitting my time between the kitchen table and when I found myself getting lazy at the kitchen table, I would move my laptop to the coffee shop over the road. And when I found myself getting lazy in the coffee shop, I'd come back to the kitchen table. Oh, if it was raining and I didn't fancy going to the cafe, I'd sit at the kitchen. So I split my time between the cafe and my kitchen table. And that was where my head was. And that was where I worked. And then lockdown came and I rented myself an office during lockdown because I didn't have an office here. And that was really a productive time for me as well. That's when I wrote the Night She Disappeared, which is a novel that's coming out in um, North America on the 7th of September. Um, and then lockdown ended and the children went back to school, so I couldn't really justify paying for an office anymore. So I tried to come back to the kitchen table and it didn't work anymore for me because there's still lots of people around. And so I bought myself a desk and put it in the spare bedroom, which is a basement room with, with a window with, no, with bars and no view. <laughs> Um, and it's not, oh, it's not working for me. I haven't found a place now. I can't, I'm, I'm, and, and now my eldest daughter has finished school and she's having a gap year. So God love her. I do. I adore her, but she's around all the time and she's always in the kitchen making things to eat and what have you. So I can't use the kitchen table. I don't know. I, I'm thrown at the moment. I'm Sounds not like it's in. office space time again. Yeah, maybe go back. Maybe go back to the office. It's so expensive. I can't justify it. It's terrible. Anyway, so uh, currently at the moment, I'm in the doldrums a little bit, but I'm sure I will. September is normally uh, when, the, when the school holidays are over and the children back at school. That's normally when I, I get into a routine. But no, I don't listen to music. I used to with my earlier books, my, my romances. I always had a soundtrack for them uh, and then I had a baby uh, in 2003 and didn't like music because I wanted to be able to hear what was happening even though someone was looking after her I wanted to be able to hear if, if anything was going on and I never got back into listening to music again and now I just write in silence really yeah and it's never really silence is it in our areas of London I mean I'm really close to um, a big hospital there are 
you know, ambulance sirens going all the time. I'm near um, the area of Brixton, which where there's there's constant police helicopters overhead. Yes. And yeah, so it's just, um, it feels very urban. And, you know, so there's always a backdrop of noise. Yes, oh, it's, it's no, it's not, not beautiful beautiful tranquility, silence. is it? No. <laughs> silence. It's, yeah, city silence. Yeah. City silence, yes. Yeah, um, but yeah, noisy neighbours as well. Like, noisy neighbours, my God, there's been plenty and, of those in lockdown. And noisy neighbours, yes. Um, and yeah, so I just sort of drink tea, really. Drink tea in the winter and Diet Coke in the summer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it. I've got a Diet Coke in front of me, and I wonder if that's another thing. We discovered, um, everyone, that Lisa and I were born on exactly the same day. So not just the same birthday, but the same year. And I'm a Diet Coke addict. Yes. And I think it's it's very much our kind of era, isn't it? The kind of late 80s, early 90s yes. kind of Diet Coke days Diet when Coke those, those ads <laughs> were kind of required viewing, weren't they? Those amazing um, yes. Diet yes. Coke ads. Yes. <laughs> Huge cultural moments. I will say for those of you watching, their birthday was yesterday. So happy belated yeah. birthday. We almost we almost got to do the events on their birthday, but I saw on Facebook, I was like, oh, so Belated birthday. We'll miss, we've missed it by one day. Oh. Um, yeah. You'd have, you'd, have, you'd have had to have done it with me, like half half cut on champagne in a yeah. restaurant. <laughs> if you had done it on my birthday. but <laughs> It would have been fine. <laughs> it would have been fine. <laughs> would have been fine. Um, I'm going to ask, I think I'm just going to ask one more quick question and then we'll open it up to the questions that are um, here from the audience. So um, I'm going to ask two. Do you have a word or phrase that you overuse? <gasps> oh. <laughs> um yes i can't it's normally a different one in each book um fit, it might be an adjective that when you're editing you see how many how many more times can i use the word brutal i think i had one book where brutal must have been used you know sort of 30 times and i would get the thesaurus out and look for some alternatives so it tends to be more an adjective i think there was one book where bizarre came up Probably if I listed them, they would be very defining of, you know, my psychological state at the time. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely overuse words both in, in speech and in, um, and in writing and then have to, you know, have to comb them through um, during the editing stage. But sometimes you can't find a word as good as this overused one. And it's so hard. And then I'll be looking at two paragraphs and deciding which one's going to sacrifice <laughs> the, the perfect the adjective. <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Oh, for me, it's no, I don't tend to overuse. Well, certainly, I mean, maybe my readers could tell me differently. I don't feel like I overuse any particular adjectives or nouns. It's 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 those sort of movement words and gesture words. Oh, he nodded. She turned away. She walked towards. She headed in. She did. The, I find that I, I, I feel there must be other ways of explaining people moving around or having or what they're, they're, the yeah. way they're, yeah. these moves when they're talking to yeah. people. But and I looking, always, looking as well. You know, how really? many? I'm, I, I remember having a you know lovely day when I discovered the phrase in an old William Boyd. He he um, cast him a narrow look. See, that's I thought, exactly. right? Yes, I'm, that, I'm, I'm using that. <laughs> that's <laughs> exactly the sort of thing when I'm yeah. floundering around thinking there must be another way of saying this. Yeah. He turned towards her and yeah. smiled. There must be a <laughs> William Boyd. William Boyd knows that there are bit, bit better and more and different ways of saying. But I can never find. I can never find a fresh way of saying that. And and now nineteen novels in, it's just like, oh my god! I, 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 I bore myself when I'm. <laughs> Hopefully, the reader doesn't notice because they're no. just. No, I think it's so smooth that it's you know that those kind of animating sort of connections yes. are very much just kind of um part of the furniture and it's the dialogue that's you know bringing exactly. it all to life so it sort of doesn't matter but it's i think the more the yeah but with yeah. perfectionists something i mean it's so it is hard i would you know i, I would love to write a book where i wasn't re reusing any word twice you know i mean obviously you know i mean in terms of adjectives and yeah. um um adverbs um, but um, I don't think it's going to happen. I've got my favourites, and they just keep on, yeah. keep on making themselves known. They're favourites for a reason, clearly. <laughs> well, given given the longevity of both of your careers and your popularity, I'm pretty sure that you're doing just fine. It's just 
curious, <laughs> curious to see. So um, I'm going to open up to audience questions because the question that I was going to ask someone in the audience has asked. So I'll let them let them have it. Um, this this one goes back to what you were talking about with the creepy man. Um, do you think writers are voyeurs in a good way? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Writers are voyeurs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I when I walk the dog, I mean, obviously, my dog enjoys the walk. She likes to sniff lampposts and, and, and get a feel for what's been going on in the area. And I like to look through people's windows and, and see, <laughs> see what they're doing and, and see what the furniture looks like and, and just see if there's anything dramatic going on. And, yeah, so she's sniffing lampposts and I'm staring into people's windows. Um, <laughs> to, to, yeah, Absolutely. Um, I'm You're very much known as that creepy blonde woman. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of creeps. <laughs> oh no, I'm the local creep. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Lisa, pull the curtains. <laughs> yeah, pull the curtains. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, no, I think right, you have to be a voyeur. I just don't know. Yeah. You have to be absolutely fascinated yeah. by, the, by the mechanisms of other people's lives and the dramas of other people's lives and the detail, the detail of other people's yeah. lives little yeah. tiny things that make their life different from your life and yeah absolutely totally I think well I mean I like to use the word curious rather than <laughs> but no absolutely and I've a, a few of my books are, are known for their um being set in in um you know the world of property and um and so you know I want to get the um the interior details right and I had one you know this this will sum up um who I am I was at someone's house and um you know, a few of us were downstairs, it's during the day, we're having coffees. And um, I hadn't been to the house before and I went to the loo and it was upstairs. And so I just kind of crept mm -hmm. into some of the rooms to have a look, which is obviously, you know, unacceptable behavior, but I, I couldn't help myself. And I, and I saw this beautiful window at the front of the house and, so I just, and it was in the master bedroom as it turned out. I walked towards it um, to look out and a voice behind me said, hi Lou. And it was um, the host's husband in bed, sick. Oh! <laughs> he was in, you walked into he his bed. Bed. He was in the bed. Or in his house without a guide or without invitation. It was. Well, did you say, did you make up a lie? Did you say, oh, sorry, I was trying to find the toilet? Or did you just. What did I, you I, I said something like, oh, I just wanted to have a look at this chair. <laughs> <laughs> but he handled it better than me he was as cool as a cucumber as if it happened oh. every day of the week <laughs> oh that's very funny i still blush when i think about it because it yeah. really i just can't uh, curiosity killed the cat i yes. just can't help myself yes looking around yes and i think you and i are both big on houses you're much more i'd say a lot of your books are much more about property um as as more of a sort of you know a symbol of somebody's kind of um status and what have you yeah it's always a sort of crime yeah yes yeah. um but you and i both do good house i think and yeah. do yeah. good i love, yeah, I love the house you're... renovation in um invisible girl that's one of my favorite literary house renovations when she goes down doesn't she to see the um see how the renovation's going yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. And kind of reconnects with her sanity in a way. Yes, she can like living in the temporary flat, does she? No, the, yeah. I've forgotten her name, sorry, the, um, the mum. And that, that was actually based on some a, a, a true life experience, which is another thing that, that's always very interesting when you talk to writers about, you know, how much. I, I think the more books you write, the less of your real life gets cut into the book. The more of it is made up. But, yeah, so that was um, – uh, the book is set um, in this road – over there, pointing over there as if you can see. <laughs> in, Hampstead, in Hampstead, which is a much grander and more well-to-do area than where I live. And uh, we had to live there for eight months while we were having our house renovated down here. And I thought it was going to be amazing to be in this grand upmarket uh, Chi-Chi area. And I hated it. I hated it. It was soulless and the people were unfriendly and you never saw anyone. And and I hated it. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was where that came from. That that scene with Kate coming back to her her real house in the yeah, real and, and also kind of and rougher area and real people and <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's fun. It is fun to incorporate some of those um, building and decorating um, real life experiences. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. 
Have you ever met someone reading one of your books during a walk in the park or in the street, or I'm guessing on a train or an airplane or? Oh, it's Filippo. I know Filippo. Hello, Filippo. <laughs> uh, no, I never have done. People I know have, and they come and tell me that, oh, I saw somebody reading your book. Yeah. And I said that I know you. and then, uh, uh, um, But I never have done. Have you, Louise? No, but I've seen lots of people reading yours. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I have. I have. I've seen lots of people reading yours. Um, I haven't seen mine, but again, you know, people often say they have, you know, on the tube or, yes. um, you know, by the pool. And of course, people oh, yeah, now, the pool, yeah. now people share their pictures. And so they're not just saying something nice to make you feel good. They've got evidence that someone yes. was reading. Yes. Um, our house or, or whatever. And I do that when I'm on holiday and if someone on the next Sun Lounger is reading a book written by one of my writer friends, I'll always take a surreptitious snap and send yeah. it to them. It's just so yeah. nice to be out in the wild, isn't it? Doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Chaining someone on a Sun Lounger or killing somebody's like, boredom on a long train <laughs> journey or whatever. Seeing the book doing what it's supposed to do is just nice. I am amazed, yeah. given the volume of books that you both have sold, that you have not seen your own book. That is totally surprising to me. But yeah, there are things that we just don't go out very much. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I barely leave my postcode. <laughs> <laughs> We have um, seen, well, I've certainly seen posters, you know, we've seen advertising, yeah. a lot yeah. of advertising, but no, I've never seen anyone um, reading a, one of my books, but, you know, perhaps it's on a Kindle. and I, you or, know, I or they're listening to it. Oh, it's yeah. Like, yeah. That's yeah. very, particularly on transport. That's very yeah. cool. Let's It must be that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is very specific. One of the bloggers noted there were a lot of clues to suggest you were a fan of Fleabag, Louise. Any chance you are a fan and that it influenced some of your novel's details? Well, I love Fleabag, absolutely, particularly the first season, but I'm not aware of any direct influence. Um, but I guess, I guess everything, I, I am influenced by TV and old movies, and so it's not beyond the realms. Um, I'd love to know in which elements yeah. um, they think I'm influenced by. I mean, she's a very, maybe the kind of, you know, very bold young female um, would pop up in a few of my books. Um, but no, and I guess there's a London feel, isn't there, about Fleabag? I love that, you know, the beautiful um, properties, actually. See, now I'm starting to see some connections. Uh, but I am a fan, yes, yeah. Um, definitely. Who isn't? It was yes, amazing. Was say, who, could, who, could be, who could be a woman and not be a fan yeah. of it? Yeah. yeah. It was a real game changer, wasn't it? It was really, um, when I you know, saw that first episode, I kind of went rigid in sort of shock yeah. at something uh, that I was, you know, watching something really new and original. Yes, um, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. It's the, maybe it's the London feel. To, I can't yeah. think what it is. I'm very familiar. No, with it. no. I can't remember anything. I don't know. Echoes of boxes. Oh, okay. <laughs> boxes. She, she's. Oh my oh. god. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. I can't actually remember the line about seducing a priest, <laughs> um, but certainly the G and T's. Yeah, the G and T's because on the boat on the the. Um, these catamarans um, on the Thames. It's, you know, it's more like a kind of business class air travel, I guess, than, it's you know, what we know a train or tube to be in, that you get on and there's a lovely bar and there's the tinkle of glass as they make the G&T with a slice of lemon. So yeah, the G&Ts, the foxes, uh, bins, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, okay. Do you think your stories will change much in the future having gone through this past year and a half? Either of you. I, I'm going to say no. I don't think this past year and a half is going to have any impact or any in, in any way on the sorts of things I want to write about and the way I write about them. It feels completely removed. It's just, and that's part of the joy of it. Is just, and I think a lot of writers had that issue last year of they were in the middle of writing a book that was set in 2020 and having uh -huh. to decide whether to incorporate it. And I've read two books lately that where they've incorporated a few little things about they kind of referred to it as it's slightly at arm's length, whereas mm -hmm. it wasn't at arm's length. It was just everything. Yeah. Just, yes. Every, every time you walk past someone on the street, they'd be talking to someone on their phone or to the person they were with, they'd be talking about the pandemic. Uh, so I, I think you, I don't think you can go half a half. No. You have to go for it fully. And that's the sort of novel that I've got no interest in writing. So 
No, I completely agree. I've, um, I want to ignore it in my work. Yes. The, only, the only way in which I'd say that I am, I think I have been affected is that I've been quite anxious about um, the political situ situation here in the UK and you know, our leadership is um, not great. Um, and um, and I, the book I'm planning and writing at the moment, um, I've taken part of the story back to the 1990s and I think that that's a direct that's directly impacted right. by having felt quite unhappy. Because that was the last time politics yeah. was happy in this country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the 90s, you know, was our heyday. Yes. It was cool Britannia. And mm -hmm. I know I, one, of, one of my favourite books of yours, Lisa, is Before We Met, that's partly set in the 90s. I yes. never forget that it book. I deliberate. absolutely love it. it and um, so this will be mine. This will be yeah. my tribute. To our heyday. Yes, it was. It was. It was. And even my teenage daughter says it's not fair that you got to be young in the nineties. No, like, I know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I agree. It's such a shame you missed it because it sucks now, frankly, for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For a while, I was going along with the idea that we might have another roaring twenties, but I've stopped promising that now. No. <laughs> no. But it's pure nostalgia. If you want to be hedonistic, you're just going to have to hear your mum's stories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, we have a couple questions that are related. So um, if I can find them, do you have a favorite author that you like to read? And then a follow up to that from someone else. Do you have a favorite recommendation at the moment um, that you want to tell us about? So author and or recommendation, same or different. Um, Louise, you want to start? Well, can I recommend The Night She Disappeared? <laughs> of course. Which I have read and I absolutely love it. It's, I think it's my favourite, Lisa. Um, and part of that is the setting. Um, I love the setting. It's a, is it the Surrey Hills? It's it is the Surrey Hills, yes. Countryside, yeah. yeah. And I, um, Lisa may know, but I'm a real sucker for campus based books this isn't it, it isn't a campus-based book but there's the school element which is my all-time favorite subject in a novel I absolutely love um you know from prep by Curtis Sittenfeld to um I am Charlotte Simmons by Tom Wolfe I absolutely love a college or a kind of posh school story and so when I saw Lisa was partly taking this on in the book I was you know so happy um, but yeah, I, I recommend I recommend that because it's fantastic. And um, I guess my favourite author, um, you know, overall in the history of literature, I would probably say Patricia Highsmith, and she's also probably the author who's influenced my writing and you know my mindset the most. And you know, has given me permission to have dark and dislikable characters and to you know celebrate that and not feel I have to explain myself and you know try and get people rooting for that you know ambiguous flawed character rather than the perfect moral um hero or heroine so so yes Lisa Jewell or Patricia Highsmith <laughs> oh god Right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so anyway, I don't have to on from that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I always, when I'm doing events, when Louise is not in the room, and people ask me for recommendations for authors who I love, I always say Louise's name first, um, because Louise is my absolute go-to author, and you know the sort of stop everything. The new Louise Candish is here, and she never ever lets me down, and she's definitely one of my favourite authors. I don't go back as far into the classics. I'm very much when people ask me about my favourite authors, I always feel much more sort of connected with the books that I've read recently. Um, so I love Ruth Ware. I love mm, Kenneth. Yeah. Love Sabine Durrant, who is not big in America and she really should be because she's absolutely <laughs> do you, have you ever had her in, in your shop I mean no, no. I mean I've seen her books shop. when I travel overseas so I see them in the UK yeah. but I don't really see them here Such great, a she's great. an absolute genius yeah uh, lie with me we've spoken about it before yes lie, lie with me lie with me is oh. just one of my favorite books it's set yes. It's the got that actually does have a kind of Ripley esque character, Very Ripley. Um, and it's set in Greece, and it's just so beautifully yeah. um, evoked the mood yeah. and this this narrator's you know sort of sense of desperation. So he's clinging on to his lifestyle and his yeah. you know sort of sanity. And he's such so a she's loser. brilliant. 
He's such yeah. a loser. And I could use any manner of wonderful English swear words to describe him now. Um, yeah. That I'm sure your American viewers would love to hear, but I won't. But he's such a loser. Um, <laughs> You, you just root for him the whole way. He's tragic. He's terrible. If you met him in real life, you'd hate him. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. And he's, and we've, all, we've all met one. We've all met him. He was so name. familiar. I knew him. Yeah. I, knew him. I, was like, I know this man. Anyway, so that would be my, that, that I'm going to go with that one then. Let me lie. Lie with me. Not lie, lie with me. Lie with yeah. me. Yeah. As a, as a, yeah. If you can get hold of it from somewhere in the US, I really would highly recommend it. And also, Lisa, you you mentioned Ruth Ware, but her new one, One by One, is excellent. Oh, yeah. I know, so Set good. In a kind so of snowed-in alpine yes. chalet. The way, the, way she, of the way she writes about that world as well, it's just like, yeah. how do you know all this stuff? Yeah. How do you yeah. know? How do you understand the world of t tech of stuff? Apps. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. It's just, yeah, quite extraordinary. She's 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 very clever. Um, yeah, and no, that's Clay Mackintosh's new one, Hostage. Have you read that? Oh, no, I haven't, but it's on oh, my pile. And I amazing. love her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah She's so a she, brilliant writer. So she went off piste with her last one. There was something very personal that she really wanted to write a novel about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that was a beautiful book. Yeah. And now she's come back with a vengeance with this book that's like a blockbuster. It's like it's like terrorists on on a plane who are going to blow up the plane unless something. Uh, and then, uh, but they're doing it all through this one um, air, air stewardess, um, who has uh, such a brilliant of, idea. So clever, um, like a, yeah, really, really good. Anyway, I'm saving, I'm saving that for my holiday. You will read it in under a day. Will I? Oh, okay. Oh, you won't be able to stop. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's wow. so ridiculously readable and brilliant, and it's got a really, really. <laughs> nasty little twist at the end which I you know, take my hat off to her one of those moments where you just reevaluate everything you've just read with this sort of awful chill going through you of like no. <laughs> so not only is it a page turner and a blockbuster but she's also got this dark twisted little thing at the end that makes oh fantastic amazing. I can't wait yes that's lots of recommendations we just talked with her so if you want to Find that interview. It's on YouTube for those of you wanting to talk uh, to hear more from Claire McIntosh about Hostage. And I just put a link in the comments because we have signed book plates for that too. Um, so the last question that I'll ask just for fun. And again, this is kind of someone has asked a similar version of this, but my question is slightly different. Um, if you could have dinner with any literary character, who would it be? Um... Maybe I would have dinner with the Lord Sebastian Flight in Brideshead Revisited before he becomes a terrible dipsomaniac and a bore, <laughs> when he's charming and um, blithe and beautiful and 18. That's wonderful. Lisa's inspecting her shelves. I'm trying, to, I'm trying, to trying to find an answer to that question from... Not the guy from Lie With Me. Well, yeah, I could say the that. loser. I say that. The jerk. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Oh my goodness. I know I have an answer to this question somewhere inside my head, but accessing it right now is proving very, very difficult. Maybe, maybe a Nick Hornby character. Let's go for a nice <laughs> someone from a Nick Hornby novel. Um. Uh. Yeah, the one from about the boy. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. actually, no, no, the rubbish company. No, not him. Oh, I don't know. Someone from a Nick Hornby book. That's Sorry. Fine. Fail. Fail. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. I mean, we can all see a Nick Hornby like leading male character. We 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 got it. We got what it. What about the guy in high fidelity? That's what I was gonna yes, say. Yeah. That's, I think that's kind of where I was going with that. Yeah. 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 I can't remember his name. I just I think it's no. from the movie. Yeah. But yeah. you're going to have witty banter all evening, so it's going to be exactly. fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, um, about, talk about our old relationships. <laughs> <laughs> talk about your exes. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think we've done it, ladies. As uh, as I've said before, Other Passenger is brand new out today, and I still am not going to be able to get this lighting right, but let's try. Nope. There it is. Kind of. There we go. Louise Candlish, signed book plates. And then, um, of course, Invisible Girl is in paperback. We've had it in paperback for a little while. And if you'd like to pre-order a copy of The Night She Disappeared, we will have, fingers crossed, signed and or personalized copies with Lisa coming to the store in yeah. September. I'm super excited. I really hope that works out. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, um, for so many reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks to all of you for watching and uh, for you two ladies, have a wonderful evening. For those of us in the US, uh, I hope you have a, a good afternoon. Um, thanks again, bye. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much, McKenna. You were brilliant. Yes. And happy belated birthday, Louise. So it's lovely yes, to see you too. Yeah. Wonderful questions, everyone. Yes, thank you so much. Questions. Take thank care, you. everyone. Bye. I don't know.